it looks like there's not going to be a lot of people joining us, more than they already have. So um, just a small insight before I actually start with the presentation. Um, about a week back on Friday, I went to the small presentation of the talk uh, with one of the representatives of the bar camp. I don't actually remember her name, but uh, we were actually talking, and I was very tired. It was late at night. It was at 10 p.m., and the, uh, the young lady was asking me, like, are you going to talk like the way you are right now during the presentation? And I was like, I'm going to try my best not to, so the bar is set pretty high. Uh, but without further ado, today I will be talking about something called the Agile Stronghold. It is not, not actually a terminology of something that I want to explain, but it's basically the stronghold or the things that we find very strong at Webfontaine uh, within our active development cycles as Agile teams. And as you already noticed, I am from Webfontaine. I occupy the role of a project product manager, excuse me, and this is the Agile stronghold. So the definition of Agile by itself is very difficult to actually go through. Uh, but with the bottom line, it's a set of methodologies that development teams, Agile development teams use to actually think more efficiently, work more effectively, and make better decisions. This is actually the definition of Agile from a book called Learning Agile by Andrew Stellman and Jennifer Green. But the thing is that it actually does not stop there. Agile is much more bigger and wider, and the scope of it, it's, it's just too broad for you guys to understand because every Agile team in every single company has a different approach of how they want to do the job, of how they do, how they want to do the job, excuse me, in terms of Agile. Now, after the definition, you just have to focus on, in my personal perspective, three main factors that shape up the type of work that you do in the company. First of all is, of course, the Agile methodologies. They're a set of bounded things that you have in Agile. For example, practices that you do throughout the iteration and the sprint and whatnot, we'll catch up on them later on. Of course, the company culture and the actual type of or nature of the project that you have or you're working with. Uh, these three main factors actually influence on the extent to which you perform Agile in the company uh, and have that Agile me methodology or approach or mentality in yourself when it comes to development teams. So of course, all these combined together, you've got non-standard, non-similar, but the most important of which, autonomous teams that actually work on their own try to make their decisions on their own and get the best outcomes in the most efficient way possible. Now, before we actually indulge into the details of the presentation, uh, most of you should be familiar with the uh, software or system development life cycle, which is basically the stages a development team goes through in order to actually uh, get a project from point A to point B. So I've actually simplified it down to you guys based on what we do in the company because software development lifecycle is actually bound. It's, it's, it's standard and structured and it's a rock. But nonetheless, uh, most definitely you have to define the business needs initially. You got to, you got to have to know what you have to do uh, to satisfy the client. And then we actually break it down to chunks of work that we need to do. Uh, then we plan to deliver it. We start the cycle and we actually deliver. All right, so um, we're going to start off with something called the product team vision, or most of you know of it as defined as the roadmap. Uh, the roadmap is the goal of the development team. Whenever they start actually the project, they want to get to a certain stage in the project. Mainly it's the deliverable or the actual point in which you go live with a project, let's say in the simplest definition. Now what we do is we actually have the roadmap. This is just a general overview. And then we break that roadmap down into iterations as much as possible. And after we have those iterations as a block schema, we then talk about release cards and the active development life cycle. Uh, so release cards, I'm not going to focus on them very thoroughly right now because I have a portion just uh, for release cards later on in the presentation. And the reason why we have release cards is because we have iterations. If you have a release card and an iteration, then they are compliant to each other. You do the job. You get the job done at the end of the sprint or the iteration. You have a release card in which you place things and you release to whatever type of environment you want to you release to. Maybe it's the production or the user acceptance testing. 
So the active development cycle. There are things here that are very important. After the roadmap, after the idea of having release cards based on each and every iteration, you've got some strongholds, in quote, that you have to attend to during each and every cycle or iteration. Uh, very briefly, you can go through them uh, with your eyes, and we're going to catch up on them as well throughout the presentation. But the lingering question that goes on here is when we're talking about Agile, because most people think about Agile like, all right, dude, I don't really need a uh, roadmap, I just need to be as flexible as, as possible, and every time requirements come in, I digest those requirements, I put them into play in the cycle, and then I actually deliver. But uh, nonetheless, the dynamicity and the flexibility of Agile teams does not necessarily imply or mean that you should not have a vision to your team. Of course, we're, we're flexible, we'll do that we're dynamic, we're doing what the client wants, we give a minimum viable product and we develop on it as much as possible throughout the cycles that we have. But it's very important for your team members and your own self to be organized and to get to figure out where you're getting to. Uh, because if, if you don't know where you're getting to, you're not going to know where to, where to start from. So basically, uh, things become more tangible and measurable if you have a roadmap, if you have a vision. Because you know at which point and at what point, of, uh, excuse me, where you have reached and what you're doing to get to the next step and the other and the other. Um, next up, we're going to talk about the uh, roadmap types. There are two major types based on what I've seen in the past couple of years. It's either you have a development project that's starting from, from scratch, it's brand new, it's uh, not into play already, or you've got a project that is already live or is in production, and you have to have a roadmap to fulfill the needs of that production environment or the live product that you have in the environment. Uh, the differences between them is uh, very simple. Uh, revisiting roadmaps in newly incorporated projects in the company is uh, close to none because everything comes within the company. The requirements are gathered within the company. Stakeholders and business analysts and product managers and product officers all come together, have the requirements, set them into place, and actually start working. But if you have projects that are already live and you've got stakeholders on site in different countries that are actually working with you throughout the cycles that you're having, it's very difficult to sustain that standard approach that you have with new projects. People are going to be bugging you every day. They're going to give you new requests to attend to. They want new things each and every time they want to have uh, an update to their environment or their application because people from that country are wanting them as the clients uh, to a certain extent. So they're much more uncontrollable than having new projects. Um, and it's very difficult to manage that because we were talking before a slide or two, I think, about the roadmap. And if you have a roadmap and people are bugging you all the time, what is it that you do? Um, so, what the actual schema of the iteration, when we break it down, looks like. Now, we started off with something very general. We start off with something called the vision, the roadmap, and you've got chunks of things that you have to do within that roadmap to actually get from point A to point B. Now, as you can see in the graph, I've taken just a part of the iteration, or, or one iteration, part of the entire roadmap, and I've broken it down into an actual development cycle. It's a very rough schema, uh, but the main things that we use actually when we have the entire breakdown process is we start from the roadmap, we break it down to epics, epics are broken down to stories, stories get even smaller and smaller to subtasks sub or substories or tasks or whatever you want to call them. And that's how the iteration actually takes place. Uh, we also have something called spikes because we know that not all the time people are working on the product or are trying to fix things on uh, the, the environment throughout the development cycle. They're aware of the full things that are going on. There are certain things that you have to look into in order to figure out how to tackle things when it comes to the actual task, and those are called spikes. Next up is uh, the backlog activities. Uh, these are uh, the, the, the types of activities in, when it comes to backlog. It's, it's actually very important because it's the initial insight your team gets when it comes to the actual work that they need to do. And the main activities that we do are we actually manage the backlog, and it's much more difficult, again, let's get back to that, it's much more difficult to manage it when you have people from outside the sphere that you work in, so the development team. Outside the development team, there's a lot of people who, act, who can actually influence on that backlog. And by that I mean, with a real life case, if you've got a UAT environment, and people are testing the environment on a local site, let's say, I don't know, in America, they actually have an influence on your backlog by opening tickets and you have to manage them. Uh, but the most important 
of these activities is something called grooming. And grooming is something that we've incorporated for almost the past four to five months, I think. Um, and it is an activity that we do to introduce the team to the tickets or uh, labels or the tasks that we have within the backlog. This is the initial introduction. People get to figure out what the actual development will look like eventually from the perspective of business and tech, not only business. And they also ask questions and uh, figure out how to find, find loopholes in the requirements so that you can actually have some homework to do after you take back those requirements with the questions that they have. And the iteration-based activities. We have, in our case, and I think generally speaking on a very wide and broad spectrum, there are two major types of activities when it comes to the iteration. Things that fall outside of the iteration, and that's when you are actually gathering the requirements to actually figure out what you're going to do. Uh, after which you start uh, writing a, an FSD. I talked about it. I talked, I talked about the business processes with, uh, with my colleague Guyane last year. And then we actually extract the stories from the FSDs. FSDs stand for functional specifications. So the spec list that we have for the development. After we extract the stories, we actually prioritize those stories within the backlog so that we can get to know based on the roadmap that we have, what comes first, second, third, and so on and so forth. But the major and more, more important activities happen throughout the iteration, during the actual cycle of development. Uh, the one that most agile practitioners are already familiar with, or most of them should be familiar to the practitioners, the first one is daily stand-ups. It is the time and day, every single day of the cycle, that people throughout the team talk about the things that they have done, they're planning to do, and what the problems they are facing. Because uh, if they mention all those three, we are all on track and we're doing something called activities tracking or tackling or follow up uh, so that we actually know where we're going and what the problems are if they are blocking us. Backlog grooming, I'm just going to mention the name. I already talked about it. It happens throughout the iteration, within the iteration, excuse me. And within the iteration, you do the backlog grooming so that you're ready by the end of the sprint to have the planning formally, normally, and happily. Um, we've incorporated something new as well. It's called processes health check. Now, I'm going to focus on something that's very important here. Um, the reason why I'm having this presentation is basically not because I'm, I'm a professional Agile practitioner or I have certificates in Agile, but because Agile is more than just a block of things that you need to do in order to get things done. It's actually what suits you as a team and as a company to get things done the way you think is best for you. And when it comes to processes health check, this is something that we do every now and then throughout the cycles that we have so that we can actually get to figure out if the things that we are doing are helping us or not and how can they help us better or how can they help us if they're not, basically. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that try to be flexible within the processes that you use. If there's something you've read in a book or you've researched about online and you've seen the terminology and you know the definition of that terminology now, don't go ahead and use it right away because you might use that and team members within the team might go ham and they might tell you that I don't like this or this is something that's not working out for me. Uh, so try to process things as much as possible based on your needs and not based on the rules that Agile has put because Agile, technically speaking, hasn't put any rules. It has given us guidelines on, or, or maps, or threads, or routes that we can take in order to get things done the way we want to. Sprint work demonstration. This is where we bloat. At the end of each iteration, there are people who actually come forth. We perform a demo so that stakeholders, maybe sometimes internal board members or staff members even, can see the work that we've done in the past iteration. This is done just so people can actually have an input on the work that we've done. Not the fact that it was good or bad, for the fact that they have ideas, they have concepts, they have things that we might actually rework on because this might be better, this is not good, from the perspective of not actually being good or bad, but uh, from the perspective of the entire process. Bloat, Michoskov, Kluchkov, Aleli, within the sprint demonstration. Then the retrospective, it's the most interesting and most important portion of the entire iteration. It is when the team uh, gathers up together and actually talks about the process of the iteration. What went bad? What went good? Um, this place 
this portion, excuse me, is the portion which is the most difficult to attain or sustain because a lot of members don't actually want to talk about things here. Uh, they keep things to, to themselves and it's not so transparent, but it's the most important to actually fix the problems that you've had so that you, they're not recurrent in the upcoming iterations. So, vision shifts, the hellhole of roadmaps. What happens here is that when you're working on something, you've got either new requests or change requests. You've been working on something, people don't like it, they want to change it, or you've been working on something sustainably throughout iterations and they want to work, they want you to work on something else because of prioritization shifts. Uh, stakeholders, clients, and projects in general are very difficult to, to sustain. Um, because uh, at some night a stakeholder might actually dream of something that he wants in or she wants in his or her product and then they're going to come next, the next day and going to tell you that alright stop everything and start working on this and that. Uh, now this is okay because shifting is not that difficult. You actually drop everything that you have and move on to what you got next when it comes to priorities. But the most difficult part here is how to treat vision shifts. If you've got a vision shift, uh, you're going to start thinking about what you're letting go. That's the more important thing. Shifting your work is easy, as I said. So what happens here? Basically what we do is we try to communicate as much as possible with the stakeholders to try to prioritize the list that we have in order to let them know, all right, dude, listen, I won't do this because I'm going to do this. Is that okay? Do you want me not to do this or not to do that or yada, 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 whatever. Here, communication is very important because if you're not letting them know what exactly you're dropping off to, think, to take in the prioritized portion or segment of the work that you need to do, uh, then there's going to be a conflict of thoughts and uh, there's going to be conflict in communication later on. Uh, roadmap reprioritization is the main thing that happens here, uh, mainly when it comes to uh, the timelines that you have. Uh, most of us just want to, uh, all right, fine, I'll do this but give me an extra two weeks or three weeks on the other pointer that I have. That's the easy way out uh, and that's the most, bless you, and that's the most suitable way to actually tackle things um, because the other way is a bit more difficult to attain. It's called resource shift and resource shift is not actually people that you get into the company from the outside. You hire new people. You basically bring in people from other teams within the company for a short period of time to actually get back on track. Because getting back on track is very difficult. It's the most difficult part of vision shifts. All right, so the cart that we have, the shippable product. We talked about this very briefly in retrospect and here what happens is the actual demonstration of what we do with the release cart. It is not by definition a cart that we use in order to place things in and actually ship it outside. It's a bit more technical for me to actually explain and understand on a general scale, but it works with different branches. Development actively is done on one branch, and then on another branch, you have the release. But the idea of this is throughout each and every iteration, you've got sets of work that you need to do when it comes to bug fixes or when it comes to actual features within stories. So what you do is uh, you take in those features and stories and ship them to the outside. Uh, there's a good practice called code freeze and it's not actually just stopping all the work that you do, it's stopping all the work that you do on the branch that you're going to release from. Um, so, uh, I've highlighted in red the sensitivity of uh, releasing based on the project. Uh, why I've highlighted that is because different projects have different approaches when it comes to releasing. Uh, about a year back I was watching videos uh, on Spotify. When I was having the dry run in the company I wanted to add them but I forgot Mm, I can share them with you later on after the talk. Spotify has two videos on how they actually have the life cycle going on in the company. And uh, they use release carts in a very proactive fashion. Every single time they actually end an iteration, they share something on their actual live website, their live servers. Uh, and they call it the beta version and they have it accessible to just a small portion of people who actually test it, get back to them, and actually start working again and again and again. Release versions and carts in, in, in our company is completely different. Uh, live servers are a bit more uh, sensitive than Spotify. Spotify is a website that can actually uh, have releases on newly uh, 
newly featured products, of course testing them, but testing them very uh, not so vigorously, excuse me. Release versions uh, on our scale is going from one environment to the second, which is the UAT. It, it's being tested there as well. And it goes back and forth for some time uh, until up until we have a final version, then we move it to production. Uh, because of the sensitivity of the data we have and the, and the product in general is just, is just not a website, it's, it's an application on its own. So, next up, why do we actually keep release versions? We talked about release carts, and every time a cart goes out, you give it a version. Uh, it's very simple. There are three main things that you keep release versions for. One of them is to ease the testing. So basically, if there's a version within which you've got stories or bugs, the quality assurance engineer walks in, checks in which, in which version the change has happened, and goes and checks that version. Of course, he's tracking uh, from the perspective of uh, QA, BA, uh, product manager, developers as well, to get to know what feature or what, what bug has been incorporated in what version of the application. And last but not least is the formal approach of why we keep it, is to formalize the release notes. If you have a UAT environment, you have to let the people know it on that server when and on what version, what features, or what bugs have been deployed. Uh, so how to keep uh, release-based versioning in the project? Uh, it's very easy. If you're already using a predefined software, it already gives you a lot of uh, abilities to actually keep that release-based versioning. Uh, we uh, in the company use it for something else. To make it easy, easily trackable, we actually incorporate it within the uh, FSDs, the functional specs. Uh, and the reason why we do that is because the extraction process, as you recall, comes from the functional specifications from which you have stories, stories are labeled, stories are linked to versions. And that's why it's easily tracked. And we can also use a plain Excel sheet just to share it with the UAT people. Now, in conclusion, uh, what I'm trying to say here in the talk or the presentation that I have is that Agile is very easily pronounced. and when it actually comes to work that needs to be done with a product that's out there, it is very difficult to sustain that. Um, and every time you finish up an iteration, there's, there's a measure that you have to put upon yourself to actually figure out if you're doing the job right or wrong. And if you always have constant vision shifts from outside, people are telling you to change this and change that and do this instead of that and do this instead of that and whatnot, it's going to be very difficult to track it. and. Uh, it's very difficult to sustain a roadmap in not so much of a newly available product or a project, but in an already active one. Um, so how to sustain things here? Uh, from my personal experience, I would recommend people who are actually practicing Agile there to uh, focus a lot on, uh, on communication initially. Uh, because the more you talk to people who are in contrast to the job that you're doing, uh, the more they're aware and the more you're safe. And the more formal it is, the more you're safe. Second, get some additional help. You've got people in the company that can help you in any company that you're working, whatever role that they are, even if they're vertically or horizontally with the same role that you are or above you as the product officer or I don't know, the marketing manager or the business development manager or whatnot. Uh, get some advice from them because they can help you with the processes that are going through. Uh, or if you don't have anyone inside, go outside. People out there help you a lot. The internet helps you a lot. It's the best friend that you can ever ask for in this uh, day and age. And finally, organization. Keep things as organized as possible. If you have a roadmap, try to stick to it as much as possible. Uh, focus a lot on uh, resource shift if you've got a change or if you've got a vision shift. If you've got a vision shift, stack it up with a resource shift. Get back on track. Keep the stakeholder happy. Keep the team happy. And don't hurt yourselves. Thank you very much. I'll be taking in questions if you've got any. Yes, please. Whichever way you want to. Process health check. I did want to come. Oh, process health check. All right. So we've got a predefined set of metrics. Uh, they are divided into four main segments. In the near future, they're going to be divided, I think, into six. The first one is the iteration in general as a segment. The second one is the pre-iteration pre or pre-spint segment, pre-spint, excuse me. The third one is the quality assurance, and the fourth one is the development. 
There's no specific ranking to those, but there are specific metrics in each and every big portion of these segments. Uh, metrics are, for example, in the development metrics, we've got unit test creation. Uh, in the uh, QA, we've got automation. We've got test approach creation, for example. Pre-sprint pre planning, we've got the grooming efficiency, for example. And many, many metrics. Mm -hmm. No further questions? Yes, please. So I know you from somewhere, I think. Yeah. I think. OK, go ahead. So the process you, you discussed is mainly related to somehow Scrum. Yeah. I would like to know whether uh, there are any kind of frameworks you use in your company other than Scrum, for example, Kanban, yeah. without iterations. Yeah. Uh, actually, the project that we work on, our, our development team works on, uh, the one that I'm, I'm managing, uh, is in production. So we don't actually have uh, only one board. We have another board, which is Kanban board. And the Kanban board is only uh, for the production support. So every time there is an issue on production, it is something that you can actually put into the process of grooming, planning, and whatnot. It's something that you actually have to fix on the spot or within the coming day or two. It's production. Uh, so what happens is that it falls into the Kanban board. The first developer that sees it pulls it out does it, closes it, and we move forth. And um, yeah. for, you talked about uh, code freezing. Yes. Uh, and I would like to know whether you use some code feature flags or feature toggles to turn off some feature before releasing it, for example, if it's not completely done? Yeah, to be quite honest with you, uh, you're asking the wrong person that question. I've only talked about the feature or the process that we use uh, entirely. It's a bit more deeper for, for my understanding because I'm not a technical uh, individual, but uh, there is a process that we kind of use and we're trying to optimize as much as possible right now because it's a very important, uh, it's a very important approach that we, you should use uh, because the active development cannot stop at the end of the iteration, but the quality assurance engineer is trying to actually test everything that's going on there. Uh, so overlapping in those two is, is, is uh, causing havocs might cause havoc, let's say. Uh, I don't know the depths of the processes or the actual techniques that we use in order to, to freeze the code, uh, but there are approaches that we use and we are working on improving them as much as possible. No problem. Thank you.